So it's so wonderful that you're here today and to our online viewers, I'm so happy that you've come to, to be a part of our community and if you're ever in our area, we just welcome you to take part in one of these services. We'll make you feel right, right at home. And uh, we have a quick question for everybody that's here and for our online viewers. Uh, what's your greatest fear? What's the greatest fear that's ever been around you in life? Is it lack? Is it different things? Well, people have fear. Let me just list off a few. Some people are afraid of crocodiles. Some are afraid of bears. Some people are even afraid of mice. I, I wouldn't say I'm afraid of mice, but people are afraid of public speaking. I used to be so afraid of speaking in public. It was a huge phobia in my life. Um, people are afraid of snakes and spiders. People are afraid of the dark. People are afraid of death and dying. So there's a lot of fears. There's just yesterday, my daughter, Jasna, my youngest daughter, came down. I was just downstairs and she came and she said, Dad, there's a spider. Can you come and kill it? And I'm thinking, oh, okay, I'll come and kill it. And uh, she looks so scared. It's like, must have been as big as a hand possibly. I don't know, but it was a big Canadian spider, which meant it was almost the size of, ma'am, I don't know, what do you call those little 10 cent pieces, a uh, little dime. And I uh, looked at it and I was like, that's a big little spider, <laughs> little big spider, whatever. And uh, yeah, I just got the broom, killed it, fell to the ground and we picked it up with you know, some toilet paper and, and I showed her and the, the back of it was squashed, but the front of it I showed her and it had a, you know, a fairly big face and lots of little eyes you could see all over its head. And, and we just pointed up to her and, and dad's there, the hero, and he gave it a big bit of a squash there, you know, kill the spider. And I felt like God. I felt so good. I felt like I'm her protector. I'm her source. And, and she looked, you know, it's like so wonderful that you feel that way. But now I know how God feels when fear or negatives or things get around our lives and this year, we're talking about wisdom to win. And uh, if we have a look at negatives may have come around us in the past, but Romans 8, 28 says, In all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. He loves us. We love Him. And He's ready to squash those spiders, you know, work them, you know, get rid of them. And so back to the illustration, if you're afraid of talking to new people, you may miss the opportunity to talk to your wife-to-be or your husband-to-be. You know, you might, if you're afraid of crowds, you might miss out on an amazing hockey game, basketball game, you know, football game or soccer game, some of the finer things of life. You might miss out on those. Afraid of sharks, you might not swim in the ocean. You miss the salt water experience. Afraid of making mistakes, you may never try anything new. Just stay in that normal everyday life. But you know, we even look at Mark Twain. He said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you did not do than by the ones that you did. And so you, that you did do. We might be afraid of doing something wrong, but you know sometimes that's a disappointment, but you'd be far more disappointed by not taking new steps in life and going where no man has gone before, Star Trek. You know, things you've never done. And so Jesus shows us that fear will try, will try to stop us. But we should focus on living in joy. Joy is infinite. Now, fear is finite. Joy is linked in with the power of God. It's infinite. It's, it's all-consuming and it overcomes. And so we see in John 10.10, 10, the thief approaches. He does approach. He tries to come near with malicious intent. So his intentions aren't to give you a happy day. Oh, happy day. No, it's in malicious intent, looking to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came to give life with joy and abundance. He has a plan for good. So why do we focus on the negative? Focus on all the wonderful, infinite good things that he has in store. Robert Kiyosaki, a, a great um, person that understands finance, wrote and said this, don't let the fear of losing be greater than the excitement of winning. We're, gonna, we're talking about wisdom to win this year. God's wisdom trumps and overcomes every circumstance in life. And so if we understand wisdom, we can walk in a winning race. I almost missed the opportunity to be married to this wonderful lady. Well, I, the, the day I had you know, got to you know, ask her to marry me, even as the words were just about to come out of my mouth, this thought came into my mind. I'd never thought this before. What if she wouldn't say yes? But this thought came into mind. What if she says no? You know, the thought came there, I froze for a few seconds, and then this next thought came in the other side, if you don't do it now, you'll never do it. So I said, Carmen, would you marry me? She leant in and said, yes, Stephen. I was like, oh, yes, yes. It was a lie, it was a deception. 
But imagine if, if we don't do some things with the God is wanting us to step into, the joy, the excitement we would have missed out on. So we've got to learn to overcome fear. We've got to learn to overcome some of those thoughts that have been embedded in our lives that, have, that, uh, that enable that. Fear is the enemy of everything good happening in your life. Everything good that God has planned that we can step into, that we can walk into, God won't lift us up and put us in the middle of good. He will allow us to step up and walk into the promised land, take hold of, lay hold of. But then there's fear that tries to lie and tries to hold, up, hold us back. So we're overcoming fear. And we see in this verse, we see that John 10.10, 10, the thief approaches. It doesn't say he jumps on top of you. It says he approaches with malicious intent looking to steal, slaughter, and dis destroy. In the ver voice version, we notice it doesn't say he has already killed. It doesn't say that. He's already stolen from you, and he's already destroyed you. No, you're alive, and he's just merely coming in, into your presence. He's coming and approaches you. But all the enemy can do is approach. All he can do is, is, is bring fear. All he can do is lie and deceive with some type of intent. Because if you don't allow him as a child of God, I am a child of God, we were singing today. As a child of God, he cannot come closer to you. We're going to explain that in a moment. If I'd listened to fear, I may not have asked Carmen to marry me. If I'd let that deception get in and listened to that first thought and said, oh, she's going to say no, so I won't ask. She was just ready. She was waiting. She was wanting me to ask her. She was just desiring and so she says, ah, and I would have disappointed her so badly that day if I hadn't have asked her to marry me. And so if I hadn't have asked her, I wouldn't be here today. If I hadn't have asked her, we wouldn't be married. We wouldn't have had Jabek and Jake, and they wouldn't exist. Not only that, the children that are in our family would not be in our family. They wouldn't be in this country. This church wouldn't have been planted. Carmen would have been somewhere else. I would have been hunting crocodiles in the outback of Australia still. Something would have happened. Because I followed her all the way back over to Canada like a little puppy dog, trying to find my way home. And this is where I ended up, and this is what's happened. So much good has come from hearing from God. And so if I had listened to one little deception and never asked her, we would never have gone to the next stage. So James said, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is amazing. Why will he flee? Well, look at the next verse. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Submit to God, resist the devil. He will flee. Why? Because I'm drawing near to God. God's drawing near to me. In his presence is fullness of joy. When the presence of God comes, the, the enemy, the devil, he's so afraid, he runs away. He runs, not, be, not because of me, but because I've drawn near and now God is with me. God is all around me. He's, so, he's full of fear. He is so afraid of God that he's panicking. He's stricken with fear. He runs in terror. And so did you hear that? God with you. The greatest spiritual warfare you can ever do is to draw near to God. You will terrify the enemy because the moment you draw near, he draws near. And so we see Jesus said, content, you know, the context of this is victory or winning in all situations with wisdom. Jesus said in Luke 10, 18 to 20, and he said to, G to, to us, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Look at this perception. He fell, struck down. So quickly did he fall. He was pushed out. And so behind, it goes on to say, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Every negative spirit, every spiritual force of negativity, of demonic, all that, it's all subject to you and to me as a child of God. The moment we draw near to God, God draws near to us. Every other thing has to flee. It's subject. We have authority. And we must understand this, that we have all authority. Luke 10, 19, to stand on snakes and scorpions. So how do we remain victorious? It's just like when I went upstairs. My daughter, she did, she, she, Jenna, Josie, sorry, Jasna, the one of them, had been looking at this spider. One of the millions was, was up on the, on the roof, and it was one day it was above one of the seats. The other day it's above one of the doorways. The other day it's outside of Barbie's room. Barbie's room. Jasna's got a little room with all these Barbies. So many Barbies in there. I, I, I have a, a Barbie phobia. I think I'm afraid. That's my fear is Barbies. And you go in that room and there's Barbies everywhere. Well, Jasna was afraid. You know, this spider kept moving around. But she went and told Daddy. 
Daddy came up big, strong daddy, big savior daddy. I felt like Father God. I came there, squashed that thing, pulled it down, it's in my hands, I showed her and squashed it in front of her. And that's what God loves to do for us. He's our father. He's our protector. We draw near to him. He draws near to us. He's on our side. We have nothing to be afraid of. Everyone say, I have nothing to be afraid of, except fear itself. The moment we allow fear in, the moment we start focusing wrong. So how we fear reveals self-focus. We see Dr. Creflo Dollar said that, remember, sin is based in selfishness. And selfishness is based in fear. So any form of fear around your life is a symptom or a reflection of the fact that we're self-focused. When I look at a beautiful girl, which is now going to be, which is now my wife, but she was before, the moment you see her, you start looking at my, myself going, oh, well, I might measure up. What happens? What happens? You know, you're just about to ask her. She might say no because I'm looking. Insecurity. It's all fear-based because I'm focusing on me. I'm not focusing on my big God. So, of course, she loves this guy because God's in me. And, of course, she'd be so disappointed if she wasn't married to me. And I just keep preaching that point to her. And so... I just want to encourage she already is. I know I'm too. Self-focus opens a doorway to fear. The moment we keep focusing on me, 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 I, 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 my, 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 all of a sudden, focus on living in joy. We see it says in John 10:10, 10, 10, the next part of the verse, Jesus said, I came to give life with joy and abundance. This word abundance simply means too much, overflow, excess like a cup trying to fill a swimming pool into that little cup. It's too much to have. God has more than you ever would even understand. But all we need to do is focus, link up. Now, all that source is at our disposal. While we're looking at fear, we're cut off from the source. Protection, grace, all these things. And now we're deceived and lied to make poor choices. Dr. Carmen is going to share with us today how each one of us can open up to this wonderful thing, overcome fear, live in joy, have abundance because of all the wisdom that God has for us to win. So Proverbs chapter 3 verse 17 says, wisdom will lead you to a life of joy and peace. Turn to the person beside you and say, wisdom will lead you. Wisdom will lead you to a life of joy and peace. And so over the last few weeks, we've been talking about this life of joy that God wants us to, to live, this life of joy that wisdom will lead us into, and that there are some hindrances to joy. And we looked at a few of these hindrances. The first hindrance we talked about was stress. The second hindrance we talked about was worry. And today, the third hindrance to joy is fear. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Anxious fear brings depression, but a life-giving word of encouragement can do wonders to restore joy to the heart. So it says where there's fear, where there's that anxiety and fear, it's going to bring depression into someone's life. But it says there is a life-giving word of encouragement that is going to bring a restoration of joy to the soul of your life. And the footnotes say here, sometimes we have to find the life-giving word of encouragement rising up in our own heart. It means we're not looking to an outside source. We're not looking to someone else. Will everybody just come and encourage me? Can you all come pat me on the back when you leave today? Will you all come and encourage me today? No, it says that you're going to look on the inside of you and draw from the inside of you the word that is going to rise up and encourage your own heart. It says this is the secret of finding perpetual encouragement by the word that lives in us. So if it's your first Sunday to church and, and you've never heard the preached word before, then today the word's going to go into your heart and you're going to be able to draw from it that joy and that encouragement when you need it. If you've been in church before and you're continually hearing the preached word of God and you're going to the Bible and getting the word into your life, there is a reservoir of encouragement on the inside of you and you go when you need it. You go, you reach in and you draw the life-giving word out to encourage yourself in the Lord. And that's what brings a perpetual joy into our life is the reservoir of encouragement from the word that is already within us. We're not looking for it somewhere out there. It already is inside of us. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God will never give you a spirit of fear. 
says God will never, 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 he will never give you a spirit of fear. He says, but the Holy Spirit gives you mighty power, love, self-control, and many translations say a sound mind. Just touch your mind and say a sound mind. It says God will never put fear on you. So wherever there is fear trying to creep into your life, you always know the source is not God. For God will never give you a spirit of fear. But God brings a soundness of mind and power and love and self-control around your life. If you were to do a search in the Bible on fear not, 365 times in the Bible it says fear not. Well, I think that's good for one every day of the year. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Every day of the year, fear not. And Isaiah 35 verse 4 says, Tell those who worry, the anxious, the fearful, take strength, have courage. There's nothing to fear. Let's say that part out loud. There's nothing to fear. It says, I want you to tell people who are worried, people who have some anxious thoughts, people who are fearful. It says, tell them, take strength, have courage. There's nothing to fear. Look here, your God right here is your God. The balance is shifting. God will right all wrongs. None other than God will give you success, and he is coming to make you safe. Isn't that good? It says, you know, the balance is shifting. If there's been some wrong things that have happened, if there's been some situations where you haven't been treated probably, the balance is shifting. God will come and he will right the wrongs. That you have nothing to fear because God himself will fight for you. Have you ever wanted to fight for yourself? It's kind of my personality. I just like to fight for myself, right? And I had to learn. I don't have to fight for myself. I don't have to defend myself. My God will fight for me. My God will defend me. My God will stand for me. I have nothing to fear because I have a good father who will fight for me. So how do we overcome fear and live in joy? What is the antidote for fear? We must become intentional about what goes in to our mind. This is the antidote for fear. You must become very intentional about what goes into your mind. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says, So keep your thoughts continually fixed on what is authentic and real and honorable and admirable and beautiful and respectful and pure and holy and merciful and kind. And it says, and fasten your thoughts. I kind of think like throwing a lasso over something. And fasten your thoughts to every glorious work of God, praising him always. We have to become intentional about what goes into our mind. We have to continually fix our thoughts. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying you got to fix your thoughts on what is right and what is true and what is profitable to your life. And so it's about filling our mind with the right thing. And that's what the voice translation says. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, fill your minds with the right things. And a lot of times people re recognize they have wrong thinking. And so they begin to focus on getting rid of the wrong thinking. Well, how many know that if you're focusing on getting rid of the wrong thinking, what are you thinking about? The wrong thinking. So you end up in a trap. The more you try to get rid of the wrong thinking, the more you're thinking about the wrong things, and you're double trapped again. It's not so much about emptying yourself of the wrong thinking as it is is about filling yourself with the right thinking. You begin to fill your mind with the right things, it pushes out the wrong things. So as you begin to fill your mind with what God says, what the Word of God says about you, what the Word of God says about your future, what the Word of God says about your finances, what the Word of God says about your marriage, when you begin to fill yourself with what God says, the right thinking, it will push out the wrong thinking. That's why we must fill our mind with what is right. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. What's the sign of a new person? By changing the way you think. Have you ever met someone and there's a change in their life? You know, you just a noticeable, you're like, wow, you've really grown, you've really developed, you, there's just a change in your life. Well, the change on the outside is always a byproduct of the change in their thinking. 
When their thinking changed, so did their life. When their thinking changed about their health, so did their natural health begin to change. When their thinking changed about their finances, so did the, the bank account change. When their thinking changed about their relationships, so did the marriage change. So it's about the thinking being changed. It says, allow God to, to transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And it says, then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good, and it is pleasing, and it is perfect. The will of God is good, and it is pleasing, and it is perfect. There's no place that you would rather be than right in the middle of the will of God, because it is good, and it is pleasing, and it is perfect. And when our thinking has adapted to understand that God has our best intention at heart, that God wants us to have a good future, that God is on our side, that God stands with it, when our thinking is changed to do that, we now embrace the will of God because we know the will of God is good and perfect and pleasing. And we begin to love and embrace the will of God in our life. Most people are driven by the flesh. And that's why they are filled with fear. Matthew chapter 15 verse 19 says, Out of the mind comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual sins, stealing, lying, and speaking evil of others. It says out of the mind. This is what comes out of the mind. Have you ever heard somebody say that person needs to get their mind out of the gutter? Anybody ever heard that saying? Just turn to the person beside you and say, In the past, occasionally, my mind was in the gutter. Okay, and so that's where that saying came, get your mind out of the gutter. The scripture says, out of the mind comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual sin, stealing, lying, speaking evil of others. It says, the, it didn't say that it came from an action. It says it started in the mind. And whatever starts in the mind, if we don't learn to control what's in the mind, it will eventually work itself out into the actions. And so it's important that we begin to get our mind out of the flesh and into the spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 6 to 7 says, For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset controlled by the spirit finds life and peace. How many like peace? It says the mindset of the spirit finds life and peace. In fact, the mindset focused on the flesh fights God's plan and refuses to submit to God's direction. It says that when we're in the mindset of the flesh, you know, the me, myself, and I, I want it my way. When we're in the mindset of the flesh, it says that we actually fight against the good plan of God. Can you imagine fighting against the good plan of God? How many of you, let's be honest, how many of you ever fought against the good plan of God? You know, God's got this great plan. And you're like the me, myself, and I, me, 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 me. And you're fighting. You're fighting against the goodness of God. You're fighting against the provision of God. You're fighting against the very thing that God wants to do because of the mindset of the flesh. And so it says here, but it says, when you get into the mindset of the spirit, you have life and peace. And that is a glorious life. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, for the human mind is most deceitful of all things. It says that your mind is deceitful because your mind can be so easily deceived. If you notice, notice that about your mind, that if someone was to come in right now, how many got children upstairs? Some people got some children upstairs. If someone was to come in right now, they'd run in the room and they said, there's a man upstairs. He's got all the kids. They're all being held hostage. You know, they've got guns and all your, and we're, we're trying to figure this out. How many know that if you're a parent in this room, you would immediately be stricken with fear? True? And yet there's no evidence that there's anyone there. There's no, we, no one, see, you know, you haven't seen it yourself. You don't know for sure if it's true, but immediately you would be stricken with fear, even though it's a lie. Why? Because the mind is easily deceived. So if the mind is that easily deceived that someone could come and tell you a lie right now that could actually turn you into an absolute fearful mode, then that means if your mind can be deceived that easily, that you must become very careful about what you let into your mind because your mind is looking to grab hold of something so you must feed your mind truth so the question is to be able to get out of fear the antidote to get out of fear is what are you listening to you know what voice are you listening to 
And Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. That we have to continually hear and hear and hear and hear and hear again the word of God because our mind is looking to grab hold of something. Our mind is looking to be filled. So we need to fill it with the right things, with the word of God. Luke chapter 8 verse 18 says, So pay careful attention to your hearts as you hear my teaching. For those who have open hearts, even more revelation will be given until it overflows. It says that if you're listening, if you're really listening, that you won't just hear, but you'll have revelation. How many know that you can be in church and not really be in church? Okay? You can be in church and not get anything. The word can be good. The worship can be good. God can be there. And you can leave just as empty as you came in because you were there, but you weren't really there. But it says, you know, if you will listen, if you'll have your ears open on the inside of you, if you come with an expectation of, God, your word is going to fill me this morning. God, you're going to speak to me. God, I know I'm going to get something today. It says that you will not just hear, but you will have revelation. And the thing about revelation is it cannot be easily stolen. How many know that you can hear something and two days later you can't remember what you heard? But when you have revelation, it goes deep into the inside of you. And it cannot just be easily robbed from you. And so you have to have the ears. You choose to allow your ears to be open to revelation. And Luke chapter 8 verse 18 says, I hope you're still listening. I hope you're listening carefully. You know, it's Jesus saying, I hope that you have your ears open to not just hear, but to really listen. So you grab hold of something that's going to create joy and dismiss fear out of your life. So the antidote for fear is to begin to be very careful about what goes into your mind. Be very conscious about what fills your mind. And so I want to give you a few tips this morning as we're um, closing of how to overcome fear and live in joy. Number one, stay focused on the right things. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, so set your minds and keep focused habitually on the things that are, that are heavenly things, not the things on earth which only have temporal value. It says, I, I, I tell you to stay focused, to have a habit of being focused and not just on the temporary thing, not just on the temporary problem that you have. How many of you know that if you just are looking at the temporary problem you have, fear is coming in? And fear is going to take you down. If the, all you can see is the temporary problem, fear will grab hold of that. It says, don't have your mind, don't be focused on the temporary problem. Lift your eyes, stay focused on that which is above, that which is true, that which is right from the word of God. And you must stay focused on the right things. The second one is you have to make up your mind to actually obey God. You get to choose ahead of time. Psalm 119 verse 112 says, For I have made up my mind to obey. You pre-make up your mind. God, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. You know, you just make the decision ahead of time. God, you're going to speak to me. I'm confident you're going to speak to me. And whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. You make up your mind before he tells you what to do. Before he tells you to forgive the person you don't want to forgive. Before he tells you to apologize to the person you don't want to apologize. You make up your mind, God, whatever you tell me to do. I'm ready to obey. It says you make up your mind. You pre-make the decision. The third one is continually let your mind be renewed. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23 says, And be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude. And I was thinking about what it says, an untarnished attitude. It says, let your mind be renewed where it's not tarnished. And if you think about silver, if you've ever had a silver ring and took it off your finger and your finger went green, or if you've had a piece of silver and you haven't, you know, used it for a while and you go and it's all tarnished, what do you have to do? You have to take out, you know, the silver um, and the silver scrubber and you have to scrub it up and make it shiny again. And that's the same with our mindsets. It says continually renew your mind because otherwise there's some tarnishing that's trying to come in. There's some wrong mindsets that are trying to come into you. We live in the world. We're not of the world, but we live in the world. So guess what? There's some tarnishing trying to come around your mindsets. And the Holy Spirit says, get off the cloth and renew the mind. Get out the word of God and renew the mind. Scrub the mindsets so that it can shine again. And how many know that we can teach you the word? 
but we can't scrub the mindsets for you. We teach you how to do it, but it's your job to pick up the cloth. It's your job to pick up that word of God and renew your mind and scrub that thing so you begin to shine again, so your mindsets are shining, so everything inside of you is shining again because you picked up the cloth and you're shining off the tarnish so that you rise again. Only you can do it. No one can do it for you. Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if they could? But they can't. So it's our responsibility to understand I must continually renew my mind. Turn to the person beside you and say, next time I see you, you'll be shinier. Number four, when distractions come, keep your mind on Jesus. Oh, there's so many distractions that will come in life. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 says, keep your mind on Jesus Christ. When distractions come, go back to the source. Go back to your leader. Go back to your God. Keep your mind back on the one who, who is in charge of your life, who leads your life with dignity, who leads your life with integrity, who leads your life into purpose and satisfaction. When distractions come, go back to the source. Your leader, Jesus Christ. Number five, set your mind in the right direction. First Chronicles chapter 22, verse 19 says, Now set your mind and your heart to seek the Lord your God. Set your mind in the right direction that I will not make a major decision without seeking my God. I will not make a major decision without seeking my God. Set your mind in the right direction. The right direction is, God, you lead. I follow. That is the right direction. God, you lead, I follow. How many have been the leader of their own life and made some mistakes? Didn't work out real well, did it? You know? So now it says set yourself in the right direction. Set your mind in the right direction. God, you lead, I follow. I like being the follower, God. I like you being the leader, God, because you already know what's up ahead, God. And when you lead, it's a whole lot less complicated, right? And so set your mind in that direction to seek God for his guidance and direction. Number six, to be able to have this antidote for fear and walk in joy is that we have to repent. People don't like this word, but it's a Bible word, so it doesn't matter. Repent simply means, Acts chapter 3, verse 9, it says, so repent, change your mind and purpose. To repent is to, to change the way you think about something, which then changes the way you act about the same thing. It says, repent, change your mind and your purpose, turn around and return to God. It says that your sins may be erased, blotted out, wiped clean. The times of refreshing may come to you from the presence of the Lord. You know, a lot of times people say, you know, I, what I need, I, 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 I need a holiday. No, you need refreshing. I, I, can, I can go on a holiday and not come back refreshed. If you have kids, you can go on a holiday and not come back refreshed. Right? And that's the truth. And I'm not against holidays. Please take a holiday. Not all at the same time, but <laughs> please take a holiday, especially my leaders' schedule. Okay, but the thing is, is that you don't need a holiday, you need refreshing. And what does the scripture say will bring refreshing? Repentance. Change the way you think, and you'll be, re you'll be refreshed. It's got to get old thinking the same way. It's got to get frustrating thinking the same way, doing the same thing, hitting your head against a brick wall, spinning the wheels. It's got to be frustrating. But the refreshing comes when you repent and change the way you think, which changes the way you do things. So God promises that those times of refreshing, they come if we will embrace the change into our mindsets and into our actions. And the last one, number seven, how, the antidote for fear is to allow yourself to come into his presence. And that's what he said, that refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. Psalm 94 verse 19 says, whenever my busy thoughts were out of control. Turn to the person beside you and say, there are some times that my thoughts have been so busy, it's been out of control. Didn't you love the Bible? It says, whenever my busy thoughts were out of control, the soothing comfort of your presence calm me down and then overwhelm me with delight. How, how do you calm yourself down? You got to get into his presence. 
How do you get overwhelmed with his goodness, with his delight in his presence? He says, sometimes your thoughts are so busy, it's, it's all over the place. It's all over the map. Your mind is running. It's, it's going everywhere. Your thoughts are so busy, so confused. And the only antidote for that is the presence of God. You cannot calm that down by yourself. I'm sure there's a few pills out there you could probably take that might work, you know, for a moment. But the truth is the true antidote is the presence of the Lord. When we come into the presence of God, it says, you calmed me down. And then you overwhelm me with your presence. You overwhelm me with your goodness. You overwhelm me, God. And so it says you must allow yourself to come into the presence of God. God's presence is already ready. You don't have to stand in a certain position. You don't have to, you know, cross your legs and tilt your head and all these different things. There's, there's nothing crazy about it. You simply just come into the presence of God. If you are a child of God and you are thankful for what God has done for you, the Bible says you can literally just walk into that gate with your thanksgiving and walk right into the presence of God. That that gate, it is swung open to the child of God with a thankful heart. You can walk straight into that presence of God. And where all your busy thoughts are out of control, he will soothe them with his presence. And I believe bring a redirection and a, and a wisdom and a counsel to you so that you will have the remedy for joy. Proverbs 16, verse 3 says, Roll your works upon the Lord. Commit and trust them wholly to him. Because he will cause your thoughts to become agreeable to his will, and so shall your plans be established and succeed. It says if you'll put God first, if you'll trust him, if you'll come into his presence and trust God, he will cause your thoughts to turn in his presence to turn and become agreeable with his will and it says and then your plans will be established and then your plans will succeed what's all that busy thinking for most of that busy thinking in people's mind when it's running crazy is they're trying to figure out how to succeed on their own they're trying to figure out the master plan of how they're going to do it all by themselves and god says if you will commit and trust me and come into my presence and and, and really trust me he said that I will come and now I will establish your plan and empower you to succeed. But that busy thinking, that fear, that rampage in the mind, it's got to come into the presence of God. He said all of a sudden, the Bible says all of a sudden, you'll get a peace that passes all understanding. Sometimes the problem's still there. You open your eye, the problem's still there. But now you've got peace about it. Now, you're looking at it totally different. You're not looking at it with the same glasses anymore. Before it was chaos. Now you got peace. It's a peace that passes understanding because you know, God, I'm trusting you. And God, you got my back on this thing. God, I'm trusting you. And I know you're fighting for me. God, I'm trusting you. And in you, God, I know I'm safe. As long as I continue to put you first, it's going to be all right. And that's where fear is diminished and joy and peace well up inside of us. And that's what I want to pray for you for this morning. And so if you can close your eyes and bow your heads this morning. Those of you who are watching with us online, we're going to pray together as a community of faith right now. And as we pray together, we encourage you to boldly, wherever you're watching this, speak these words outside, out of your mouth, begin to pray and confess with us. And as we activate our faith, we're going to agree with you as well for over your situation that peace and joy will come to your situation as you put your trust fully in God. If you trust him, he's got you. If you'll trust him, he's got you. And so I encourage you, as we're about to pray, transfer that trust off of yourself and onto him. And so this morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're in the place that you've never given your life to Jesus, maybe you've never said, Jesus, I need you to be the leader in my life. Not just a God, no, my God, my God, my leader. And if you've never done that, or maybe you've done it a long time ago, and right now you realize that you haven't really been putting God first, and you need to recommit that to God today, I want to encourage you, this is your moment. This is your moment that God has brought you to this place for such a time as this. It's your moment to transfer that trust onto God. And the second thing I want to pray for today is if you know there's fear, you know there's a, there's a fear that's been haunting you. There's no, you know there's a fear that's been crouching around your door. 
And today you want to come into the presence of God and be able to see that fear diminish and walk out with a new peace. Walk out with a new found lasting joy. I'd love to pray with you today. And so if either of those are you this morning, I just want you to slip up your hand, slip it right back down so I know it's you today. I like to activate my faith for those who are receiving when I pray for you. So if that's you, I want you to lift your hand, give me a wave, let me know that you're receiving. See, when we lift our hand, we also draw on the presence of God. We say, God, I heard your word, and I know that's for me. If there was no one else in the room, God, I know that was spoken for me, and I receive it. So when we respond, that's what we say. And so this morning, as those of you who have responded and lifted your hand, I want to pray with you today. So I encourage you first to repeat these words after me, and then I want to pray for you as well. So I encourage you to say these words and say, Jesus, today I make the choice of my own free will. I choose you, Jesus, as the leader in my life. I open the door of my heart and I say, Jesus, you have a place, first place in my heart. I thank you that you are leading me into my purpose. I thank you that the wisdom of your word is going to direct my path in Jesus' name. Jesus name now father every person has lifted their hand right now we just thank you for your anointing coming around them God you are as close to us as the breath we breathe and so God right now we enter into your presence with thanksgiving God we are so grateful for what you have already done in our life father right now we take every worry every anxiety every fear and we roll it onto you right now, God. We transfer our trust in your presence, God. We transfer it off of our shoulders onto your shoulders, God. God, we thank you. You are well able to handle the situations. God, we thank you that what we need to do, God, you're going to speak to us about our part. And God, you're so gracious and good to always do your part. Father, right now in your presence, we receive your peace. I want you to just say right now, God, I receive your peace on my heart. God, I thank you right now there is a settling, a settling, a settling happening on your people's hearts. Father, we thank you there's a download of peace, God. A download, a load of your joy, God, entering into the hearts of your people, God, as they put their trust in you, God. Father, we thank you that this peace doesn't just come for this moment, God. It's to guide them. It's to walk with them, God. And so, Father, today as we loose that anointing of your peace over them, God, we thank you, God. This week, they walk in a supernatural peace. In Jesus' name.